and let's grab the right tab. That would be great if it would uh, show me the contents of the thing I'm about to share. Fantastic. Hang on, bear with me, folks. Apparently, Zoom does not have permission to share that screen. Bear with me. All right, Andy, are you planning on showing the meeting notes doc? Mm -hmm. OK. I will I be right you, back. I don't think you necessarily need to do that. I mean, people can follow along in the, the document. Sure. Yeah, 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 happy to. OK, uh, right then, actions for this week, uh, reviewing stuff from last week. Uh, draft RFC to supply, discuss supply chain security processes. Let me go and find the link for that. Oh, th this is um, this is an action item that we had. Uh, we've actually been carrying it forward for a while. Uh, there was some discussion about um, whether we would want to come up with a proposal to more formally adopt maybe targeting um, the initial salsa levels uh, across the community to start uh, ensuring higher standards for the supply chain of the artifacts that we're producing. So we kind of all agreed at the time that this seemed like an important thing to do, um, but we really didn't have the, the bandwidth or the research at that point to actually put forth a proposal. So this has been kind of a placeholder for that action. We maybe want to reevaluate the priority of this um, and see if this is something that we would want to try to do ourselves, especially now that we have the new TOC, or if we want to try and uh, identify someone else in the community to delegate this to. Okay. Um, I guess then action out the back of that. Um, is there an offline discussion to have here about whether we do farm it out? Or would you rather have that here today? I don't have enough context on this on the road. I think we can keep punching it for a little while. Okay. So I'm going to drag that forward then. Okay. Uh, RFC about reviewer teams for working group areas. On this. not had any response from the working group leads. So I guess there's not a fat lot we can do about this one. Yeah, I added a few comments, but this is more the technical part. Uh, under the assumption we want to have this uh, reviewer role then uh, which other RFCs need to be amended and uh, impact on the automation, et cetera, et cetera. But the first question of course is, do we need uh, this or not? Yeah. yeah. I said <clears throat> Oh, go ahead, Ripon. Yeah, so I, I was thinking we uh, it was more of like an extension of the contributor role, like more of like a more, like if you are a contributor, then you would like to, but I mean, like it makes sense to make it a more formal role because you probably want to have a process to get into that role, right? That's what you alluded to. Um, but yeah, makes sense, I guess. Eric? Yeah, the thing that was occurring to me is like we, I feel like we were um, kind of feeling like we would generally be okay with anyone who's a member of the GitHub org being a reviewer across any working group and area, at least being eligible to um, be assigned a review. And, but we needed that read permission to do that. And then we, we couldn't give that permission to all the repos in the org because we have some private repos. So I'm wondering if maybe there's an alternative solution where we could just grant read permissions to all the public repos or something like that in the org. And uh, then again, I mean, maybe we just do that based on whether the repo is private or public. If, we, if it's private, we assume it has something sensitive in it. 
And then we would need a formal tier to be a reviewer that would just be one of the privileges you would have. You'd be eligible to be assigned a review on a public repo within uh, the community. But I also don't know what the GitHub automation for that would look like. Maybe it would just be one massive team that has that uh, set of permissions across all of, the, all of the repos. Yeah, I think that's what we have in a pivotal org. There's like one team that everybody is part of, maybe for this reason. Yeah, possibly. I don't know. Although, I mean, we it wouldn't have been for reviewers, I don't think, because that no. I think predates even that concept in GitHub. Yeah. Might just be for some sort of single sign-on access or something. Um, <clears throat> so my intention was for it to be more like a, a, a more formal way of showing that you are that this person is in the process of gaining the approval role, right? So it is more of an, uh, an administrative tracking thing than like really an extension of the role itself because they don't get more permissions than as a contributor. It's more of a, yeah, form formalizing the tracking and stewarding them into the approval role. By so formalizing it, be it more is... of a yeah, but more of like an uh, a working group um, only decision. Like like the working group would they would be known to the working group these people, right? So the working group, so they can decide. You would ask in the working group if there's someone who wants to become an approver, right? And then you would assign them this reviewer role through a pull request. Sort of, and you're, you're viewing it as more uh, important as kind of a, a statement of intent and then visibility in terms of uh, if you're looking for reviewers on a PR, then this is the pool of people that are aspiring to maybe become an approver within an area in the working group. Yes. So target, target some of them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Make it easier to assign things, right? So you have a few pull requests that you want to distribute and then you say I will assign someone from this team as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can see that. That might be good where we want to get the working group leads to uh, comment one way or another if they find that valuable. Even if we like use it like that, you probably should still clarify that in the roles document, like Stefan said, right? So this comment still makes sense. Yeah, the technical part is an easy once we know what we want to have. It's yeah. Not a... <laughs> what generally is the relationship between somebody raising a PR and looking for somebody to review it and the working group? Oh, the, oh the, the relevant working group for, for that repo. Are they... Yeah, so repos have, or working groups have a list of repos they are responsible for with different areas. And then the areas also have approvers assigned. So you would assign. So with GitHub, you can configure for a team, like that area, the people in that area um, um, all belong to a team in GitHub. So in GitHub, you can... Um, configure a GitHub team with reviewer permission or like reviewer settings saying like, if you assign that team, it will do a round robin of like, pick some people out of that pool of people, like say two or something or three or whatever you configure. Um, that's what a few working groups do, but that's the general idea. Okay. Yeah, because I was wondering like, if an outside person a non-member of CFF is raising a PR against a component, how do they find the relevant people to review? Um, but if it's or if it's done as a team with round robin and whatnot, then great. Um, then yes, I think it personally it makes sense to me to have those people who want to do this as a group as well. 
Yeah, I understood that one uh, motivation was um, that it's not so easy to get uh, approval rights. You need, uh, meanwhile, 20 contributions. Um, in, in the past, it was even more. And uh, just to get those contributions, uh, it would help to get certain PRs, even if they are not of your own personal interest uh, assigned so that you can work on them and then earn the credits to to get the approval role. Uh, actually, when how we approach the community to get approval role in the copy area, we did it slightly different. We um, had enough uh, our own wishes and, and changes uh, that we want to see in the cloud controller. And then we pushed just <laughs> those PRs forward and uh, moved them and uh, reviewed them and uh, asked, et cetera. So this was our uh, approach, it's slightly different, but it depends on. Yeah, but I'm mean, like, that's quite an expensive approach, right? Because I like making PRs is more expensive than reviewing, I guess, right? So that's right, yeah. But um, how come we it needed those changes, uh, <laughs> no matter what? <laughs> it was it was working out. <laughs> it was expensive, yeah, but uh, <laughs> how come it's set at twenty? What was what was the the driving force behind that? We negotiated it down. <laughs> it was higher. <laughs> uh, initially, it was copied from the uh, Knative community, right? I think so. So that's mm -hmm. where these initial guidelines came from. And then we found that they actually didn't really work for us so much. So that then we, yeah, brought them down a bit. Especially because there are some areas um, that don't have a lot of contributions at all. Right. There's not a lot of traffic, so for those working groups, it was particularly difficult to get people in the approval role. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. I was just it. You mentioned that having the group allows people to find more places to contribute, and it it sounded to me sort of like a hack around to that, and that. Didn't sound intentional to me, but I don't know. Maybe I'm missing something here. <laughs> There's a good chance I am. Um, do we then want to prompt working group leads to come and comment on this, or do we? I, think I already, yeah, I already enough? added a um, a comment this oh, morning. Six minutes ago, yeah, yeah. Uh, tagging tagging the uh, team of working group leads and requesting their input on this. So Brilliant. I think uh, we'll we'll keep following up on that. For some reason I read that as seven days ago. <laughs> Don't know why. I was looking at the oh they haven't responded in age no twenty six minutes no wonder they haven't responded. <laughs> cool. Um, I guess we can just leave this one for next week then. Um, what is next on the list? Um, outstanding PRs from the board. I got the board. We go into. Uh, oh, actually, um, uh, I think one one thing we omitted on the agenda, Andy. Uh, uh, to some, I was already July twelfth, and so uh, we've got Emily and Ryan from the Picado Working Group um, to give an update on that. So uh, I think um, we determined that um, we generally wanted to do those working group updates uh, pretty early in the session, just so they didn't get crowded out by other longer ranging discussion. So uh, maybe we can oh, really? switch over to that next. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Hi, Emily. Hi, Ryan. Welcome. Welcome back to the TOC. Thanks for dropping in. Hey, folks. Good to see you all. Likewise. Um, I'll admit that I don't have a lot of things prepared today, but I think since the last time that we were here at the TOC, um, one big thing is we've published our new roadmap for 2022 um, and did a recap of the progress we made on our 2021 roadmap. So I'm going to drop some links in here and we can maybe look at these. Is there anything else you think we should cover while we're here, Ren? Um, I don't think so. I think some of that 
questions that we had answered previously were things like health of the community. Do we see like contributors and stuff like that? We, we can get to that kind of as we go, uh, but maybe start with the roadmap. I think that's a reasonable starting point. All right. Let me share my screen and we can talk through some of this stuff. I guess beginning with a recap from last year, we made some posts on our Paquetto blog. Over the course of the last year, we really did a lot of work to take um, our existing build packs and solidify them by making sure that, you know, we had certain common features that were available across all the build packs and that the usage of the different build packs were more consistent. So now whatever build pack you're using, you know, you can add an additional CA cert, apply custom image labels, environment variables, custom process types. So just some of this across the board functionality. And then we also did some work to sort of standardize how we handle, you know, like different types of configuration. We've moved all the configuration to environment variables to be consistent, where before we had some file configuration, some environment variable configuration. And we've standardized how we handle certain types of environment variables, like a build pack specific environment variable versus a language ecosystem one, and whether we're setting a default or being more aggressive and setting an override. We've definitely uh, sort of changed our philosophy more towards setting defaults. So guiding users in the right direction, but always leaving open the chance for folks to configure stuff however they want at the last minute. Um, we also did some build pack refactorings. This was part of our 2021 theme. Uh, we've been expanding the ecosystem, of course. Uh, we now fully support Python build packs. We have a Rust build pack that's in the community, so it's not at the same level of support, but um, getting there, I think we're going to be ready to promote that in the near future, sort of to a top level recommended build pack. Um, we have support for JavaScript, uh, sort of single page front end applications that work with web servers like Nginx and HTTPD. Uh, this review says introductory support, but since we published this review, I think we've promoted this to the top level as well. We've expanded our set of Java support with Tomi, Open Liberty, WebSphere Liberty, a whole bunch of JVM Im implementations, uh, support for closure tools, and we've started adding more APM support into the project, starting with Datadog. Um, We've done work to allow all of our build packs to be process types configured with watch execs. You can use them in with sort of dev orchestration tools like Tilt and Scaffold, and it sort of provides uh, you know reloadable process types so that if you're adding changes to the container, it can restart on the fly without needing to create a new container. So this allows sort of like a, a tighter inner loop workflow with Paquetto built containers. And we've been working on rolling out support for SBOMs. So build packs now generate, uh, many of our build packs generate SIFT and Cyclone DX formatted SBOMs during the build by default. And we're working on rolling that out across our full set of build packs. We started with the most popular ones. So that's sort of like what we've done over the last year. And then moving into our themes for next year. We can crack this guy open because we're planning a whole year. This is obviously going to be at like a higher level, not as detailed as the recap stuff. Uh, but we're really looking at expanding support for different stacks. In the past, it's been Ubuntu Bionic, Ubuntu Bionic everywhere. Um, but we're working on rolling out Jammy Jellyfish. Uh, we're going to roll out Ubuntu. We're going to look into ARM support. Uh, which was our most uh, highly requested feature when we sort of did a poll with the Paquetto roadmap. And we're also working with the CMB community to sort of move our stacks to a type of metadata that's like a little bit less restrictive. Um, so in the past, we were very intent on making sure that you could never build something that was broken. Um, but now there's lots of cases where things probably could have worked, <clears throat> but we were doing such so much metadata validation. It wasn't something we had tested, so we wouldn't even sort of let it work within the system. But now we're going to try to be more optimistic, like let people try things that could work and discover that they don't. 
and do more sort of informing the community, like here's the set of things we've tested, but we're not gonna like prevent you from making these things work because if it works like great, it should work. Um, we want to help improve the build pack authoring experience with improved documentation. And we also think, you know, there's been some inconsistencies in how we've done things across build packs as we, at the implementation level, we fixed a lot of that at the uh, interface level, but I think if we can fix some of that at the uh, sort of developer experience, contributor experience level as well, um, that will help people contribute to the community or like use our examples to build their own build packs inspired by Paquetto. Um, and finally, dependency management has been a big problem for us where we sort of like bake the exact set of dependencies that every build pack uses into the build packs. And um, we've done a lot of work to like compile these dependencies ourselves. Um, and it can be a lot of toil for the team and maybe like not as much flexibility for users where if you, you know, if you need to pin to an older version of dependencies, you have to pin the older version of the build pack, but then maybe you can't get a new build pack feature that's not related to the dependencies. So we're looking on ways to sort of decouple these things so that you can have it both ways. Like we'll tell you exactly what dependencies you should use or in different situations, there's ways you can loosen it up without the only option being pinning the exact build pack. <clears throat> Um, we would like to improve the caching experience, um, especially this is a big complaint from Spring Boot folks when you're building different images, you have to download the same JDK a bunch of times. So we're looking at ways in the local dev experience to cache things across images. Right now it's per image. Um, and we're looking at reducing our own overhead compiling dependencies. Uh, we think in for an open source project, it's appropriate for us to be more directly consuming binaries produced by other open source projects. So long as we're, you know, checking the SHAs, the signatures if they exist and doing our due diligence. So we're moving towards trying to consume more upstream dependencies directly. So that's sort of like an overview of what all the big themes are here. Um, if this year is like any other year, lots of stuff will change in the process. Like things come in, people's priorities change. Uh, so this is not a promise of exactly what will happen. We're definitely gonna adapt, but these themes, we've been hearing them for long enough that we feel fairly confident that they're important to our users. And then I'm not gonna go through this in super detail, but if you want to click through over to our community repo, you can kind of see similar information, but at a much more granular level. It's like, what RFCs have we approved that are related to different themes and sort of like what, what state are they in right now? So some of those high level goals I mentioned won't be on here because we don't have a like granular plan for this is how we'll implement it, but things go here in relation to the theme as we figure out more concretely what the work looks like. That's our high level, like what's going on in Paquetto overview. Maybe I can uh, kick it over to Ryan to talk a bit about community. I feel like there's been some positive signs in that direction with increased number sure. of contributors. Yeah, um, so we can talk a little bit about one change we've made recently. We're still working out what this looks like and how it can be more useful to the community, but. Um, a change we've made recently is, is actually talking about this roadmap in our working group meeting on a much more regular cadence. Um, it's been something we, we did one last year and we did it again this year, um, but it felt like last year, folks who were really active in the community who were like constantly making contributions knew what the roadmap was. We talked about it kind of informally in other forums, but not formally say like at a working group meeting. Um, so one of the things we're changing is uh, the first working group meeting of every month. So the first Tuesday of a month uh, in that meeting has a, a dedicated roadmap uh, agenda item where we kind of talk through what's on the roadmap, our progress against it, what things are coming up. Um, and it gives a chance for folks in the community to do things like ask how they might contribute to certain parts of that roadmap. And 
we're hoping that it'll become a space where we can say, uh, guide some larger contributions from the new groups of contributors. Um, an example of this was, I think it was last month, we received a contribution of a new portion of the jammy stacks from SAP. Um, and I think that that was really uh, only possible because we were telegraphing well ahead of time. We're gonna be working on this jamming stack. We need folks to be able to help us contribute uh, and help that that SAP was very interested in, in you know, moving the ball forward on that front. So um, we're looking to see more of that kind of thing. Um, I know we're, we have uh, UBI support as a, that's Red Hat's universal base image support um, as an OS uh, stack target for you know the next six months or so, or something like that is is uh, a thing and so you know there's a a couple of folks from Red Hat who join the the working group meeting regularly it'd be great to see some contributions from them as well um, in addition to that we get you know a number of um, contributions regularly from just you know smaller individual developers um, we're seeing an uptick beyond the just open an issue and say something is wrong to the open an issue and say something is wrong and, and offer to fix it or attempt to fix it in some way, which is like already like a, a pretty good sign. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see, uh, I've posted a couple links um, in there. I've got uh, just below the, the blog post, there's a link to basically our kind of um, Linux foundation analytics dashboard. Um, I go and look at this from time to time just to, to see what's going on there, uh, see if we're seeing some, some upticks in other groups um, contributing. And I feel like recently we have seen some of that, but it's still very early days. Um, I think you're gonna see the classic kind of lots of contributions from a small set, usually like vendor backed like engineers, and then you're going to see this kind of a long tail of just like individual engineers. Um, the other thing that's kind of interesting to look at, and I don't, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see this, uh, is the Slack dashboard for uh, folks who are joining our, uh, our Slack instance. We've seen an uptick on Slack of folks joining, asking questions about new features, reporting issues, um, asking how they can get involved, that kind of thing. Um, currently, we're seeing something like, you know, 552 total members, something like 67 folks uh, active on any given week. Um, the last thing I think I'll say about community is we've had uh, recently a community open source manager join the team. Um, this is David Espeo. Um, he's a VMware employee, uh, but is really helping us just kind of focus on what are the things we need to do and how can we be better organized to help kind of support the community and enable community around Paquetto Build Packs. Um, one of the things he's done most recently is go through this kind of OSS health assessment. The results of that and, a, and kind of a project plan for it are in the blog post, which is the last link I have posted there, uh, the, the OSS health assessment blog post. Um, in it, David kind of outlines, you know, over the next few months, what are the things that our uh, project is going to be taking on as steps to kind of um, further outreach to the community um, and make it easier for, for folks in the community to join and contribute and, and use Paquetto Build Packs successfully um, so that's kind that's of a, been, no go ahead sorry i just want to jump in with one like maybe interesting point here like as we're trying to grow the contributions is that um we've typically organized paquetto governance around language family so if someone's a maintainer of a language family they're you know the owner of everything in java and then people PR stuff into any one of the Java repos. Um, we've had a lot of people come in and donate entire build packs. So it's like, I want to add support for, you know, like Open Liberty, someone from IBM coming in. And they're actually excited about maintaining that in like a long term way, but not necessarily like ready to sign up to be part of the maintainer team that's thinking about all of the build packs. So this isn't a problem we've solved 
yet, but we're thinking about like, you know, could we do something within our governance structure that allows us to like add people as maintainers for specific repos that they're like um, willing to take ownership of in the long term. I don't never want to be in a situation where there's like we accept a donation and there's only one owner. I think it has to be something that the existing set of maintainers is also willing to own, but to allow people to say like, yeah, I want to be, you know, responsible for X in Paquetto. And I think this model probably applies more to Paquetto than any other project because in many ways it's like integrations. So you can imagine someone from Datadog coming in and being like, I want to make sure Datadog works well in Paquetto or I want to make sure my technology works well in Paquetto. So we're thinking about, you know, what better meeting those people where they're at would look like. We don't, if we have not approved anything or proposed anything yet, but it's definitely on our minds. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, could you remind me what was David Espejo's role again? He's a community manager. Yeah, open source community manager. Brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have questions or anything? Oh, no, I, I thought this was great. Thank you for the, the overview. It's tremendously informative. Um, I, I, I just had a, a minor question. Emily, you mentioned one of the, the things in the roadmap about, um, uh, I think it was just, uh, actually, um, around kind of improving some of the flexibility of BuildMax. You mentioned uh, that you'd been, uh, you know, for a long time, really focused on making sure that everything was really well tested and validated together, and that people kind of couldn't get off those rails onto something that could even possibly break, and loosening that up a little bit. I was just wondering if there was a, a an example you had in mind just to illustrate um, the kind of loosening of those uh, constraints, because um, I just felt like a, a concrete example might help me understand that a little bit better. Uh, so maybe a good example would be like stack compatibility for the Java build pack. It's like the JVM ecosystem, you know, can run on almost any Linux platform. It's like if you have the JRE for the right architecture, put on any Linux and it runs. But in the past, you know, we've really only, we were only testing it on Ubuntu Bionic. Um, and therefore we would add some metadata to the build pack to be like, it can only run on our Bionic stack images. But there's really no reason to do that because the chances of it working are very high in a broad range of situations. So we moved towards like a wild card stack so that it can run anywhere. Um, so it's not doing any stack validation at all. Now there might be like a couple situations where, you know, depending on what libraries we've dynamically linked against, if you have a super minimal base image, like there are some edge cases where it could fail but I, we decided that people would figure that out pretty quickly. And then, you know, like we could work on adding features to support that, whereas very preemptively restricting where things could run, like stop people from doing what they wanted to do when it was likely going to work in most situations. Okay, got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, and, and upstream in the CNB project, so Paquetta is based on the specification that they're defining. Upstream, they're changing the kind of stack definition away from these like names that are like a, a unique identifier of like a particular flavor of distribution um, to just more kind of like general, this is a Linux, it's on, you know, an ARM64 architecture. And like, you can kind of link against those particular things to say, you know, this should run on, on Linux on ARM64 or AMD64, or whatever you want to say. Um, which is, I think, a little bit better as a linkage between the build pack and its underlying stack than, say, the particular flavor of distribution. Thank you very much. Um, any more for any more? Maybe one question. Um, do you have any plans regarding bringing the Paquetto build packs also to <clears throat> the VM-based uh, Cloud Foundry um, environments? 
besides the simple I built a container and <laughs> I think we're definitely excited to help with any effort that wants to bring the Paquetto build packs over to the VM based environment. Um, in the past, we had talked about sort of like shims that would make them run in the mm -hmm. environment, but it turns out there's just too many gotchas there. Like the CMB spec itself is not totally stable yet. And it's evolving. And I thought doing these shims would just end up being not robust in the long term. So I feel like we would be more excited about working with the Cloud Foundry team on a way that would, you know, allow Paquetto build packs to run and produce images without needing to be shimmed in. But we also, like that's a lot of work and a lot of work at Core Cloud Foundry that I don't, we're not volunteering to take on at the moment, but we would be very happy to join the effort and help if someone working more in the Core Cloud Foundry mm -hmm. wanted to lead it. Yeah, the primary thing keeping Paquetto build packs from being in, in Cloud Foundry for VMs is uh, is the, the platform itself, um, not the build packs. There's there's basically nothing the build packs would have to change in order to, to be able to run on a Cloud Foundry platform. It's just that Cloud Foundry would have to be capable of running CNBs. Um, so that work is all like, it's stuff you'd want to see in Diego. It's stuff you know, you'd want to see in, in Cappy and kind of defining what the actual build pack uh, uh, architecture you're going to run on top of for a particular application. Um, those are all kinds of things that are, we'd be happy to help and give guidance and contribute to PRs, but it's not stuff we own necessarily or are capable of kind of driving forward on a roadmap. Okay, got it. Thanks. Um, okay. I, yeah, when, one question, one thing I wanted to ask about too was, um, I, I think it's great that you've got this published um, plan about um, improving the health of the community and um, you know, the, your overall OSS health for this project. Um, it, you know, we've now got a CF day coming up um, right before KubeCon uh, in late October. And I was wondering if uh, you had given any thought yet to things about Picado that you might particularly wanna highlight there or ways that we could use that event and its association to KubeCon to elevate the profile of Picado as a project in both communities? Sounds like a good idea. I have not uh, had the opportunity to think very deeply about it yet. So unless okay. Ryan has, we might just punt that and come back to you later. <laughs> yeah, I know we're, we're, we're just getting the dates for that settled. So. Um, uh, it's not like we've had the, the call for proposals uh, yet or anything. So fair enough that yeah. it, it's a little bit early in that process, but let's getting it on your radar. Sounds valuable. I haven't, I haven't thought specifically about that. I have put in, and I know other folks in the Paquetto space have also put in uh, proposals for, for talks at KubeCon. Um, I imagine some variation of those things could probably be redesigned and looked at from a different light. Um, mine is the, the proposal I was putting forward is, is mostly a walkthrough of like what Paquetto is capable of, examples, of real use cases, showing how to use Paquetto to, to build application containers. Um, it's a, a talk, uh, it could be refashioned into a workshop um, where folks actually like get their hands on using it and, and, uh, and and trying out their own use cases. Um, so I don't know, that's just an example. We did a pretty well received workshop focused specifically on the Java build pack at last spring one, you know, cause it's Java spring. It was a nice tie in there. I wonder if we could do something more generic um, inspired by that for, uh, for KubeCon CF day. We did a, last year at the, the CF summit in the summer last year. That was last year. I don't know. The years go by these days really fast. Uh, we did one that was like a workshop around like using Paquetto to build application containers. And um, yeah, it was pretty successful. I think people enjoyed getting to see it. Uh, 
Uh, I had one follow up question about the uh, integration with uh, CF uh, on VMs. Um, you said it's mostly like a Gappy Diego um, thing, but there's also like the compatibility, right? The the user experience of like, say, we make all those changes on the Diego and Gappy side, will an app be able to restage and just work, right? With with those new build packs. And I would say the proof. answer is probably no, and I don't think we should make that statement. I think we're in a position where Paquetto, for good reason, has diverged far enough from the set of functionality that's provided in their equivalent Cloud Foundry build packs. And I don't think it would make a lot of sense for us to try to like replace them from underneath, but instead have them be things that run side by side and mm -hmm. ask folks, if you want to run on the newer CMB architecture and you're running on a Java app, you need to make some change to say, Cappy, please stage my application with CNBs instead of with the, you know, the V2 build pack lifecycle. I mean, I, I think from the perspective of an application developer, you could just regard the Picado build packs as the next major version of that kind of language family build pack anyway. And so since it's the next major version, Sure, there might be some breaking changes that you have to accommodate in your code base or your build pack configuration. But yeah, I, I view it as like, I think we have the flexibility within even the build pack abstraction that we present to application teams um, using Cloud Foundry today to accommodate that and to give them the like the optionality of switching over, you know, maybe opt in and then opt out as needed for that. Yeah. It, it does pose a, a big problem for operators, right? Because like we basically have to maintain the old build packs indefinitely. If there's no like way to move people over to the new thing without like in some organizations, those teams that push those initial apps aren't around anymore, right? So like those are typical, I mean, problems. I, I don't know, we don't have to solve it, but I mean, it's something to think about. Yeah, that, that might be a core problem to bring up more again with Cappy about the controls that they have over you know which orgs and spaces could use which sets of build packs if a platform owner is trying to retire the old set of build packs in favor of the new ones. You know, once once we get to this point where we we can mm. integrate the Picado build packs and actually have them yeah. run uh, as as a first party part of the system. That's right, a luxury problem at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, you know maybe the actually the bigger problem there is with the stack transition because that is kind of a global thing. I know we had a bunch of um, uh, issues with that and trying to accommodate the last few stragglers and then holding the platform hostage a little bit uh, going from CF Linux FS2 to FS3. And I'm not sure that we've really done anything in the interim to address that again within Cloud Controller, but we'll find out when we, when we all get jammy pretty soon. <laughs> We're not here in that capacity, but Ryan and I do both work with the, some folks that build the build packs for CF as well. And there's no no plan to stop doing that. Like we do plan to maintain those indefinitely as far as anyone can see into the future. So I don't think we're, you know, setting people up to be in a position where they've, they've reached the end of the road and they're stuck and they have to make this painful transition to move on. I think we'd like to make it, you know, if it could be enabled, making it an attractive thing that people want to do, but never something where you're forced to do it. I think the biggest problem is it's not it's not necessarily any one of the uh, or it's not necessarily the overall changes we've made in Paquetto. It's 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 often individual choices made in different language ecosystems. So, like for example, the PHP build pack that we ship in Paquetto is vastly different than the PHP build pack that is part of Cloud Foundry. Um, and it mostly just comes down to some structural differences in what we expect a PHP application to look like. Um, and so uh, we're convinced that what we're shipping in Paquetto is much more what the community expects today as a modern application. Um, and that what we have in Cloud Foundry is something that was kind of baked into the platform at a certain point in time and has become uh, very difficult for us to change or iterate to move forward and to, to create something that looks more modern. 
Um, we'd like to, at some point, be able to do things like retire those things, but we also recognize that, you know, there are a lot of successful companies out there that built an app five years ago, eight years ago, and pushed it, and, you know, beyond updating it with security updates, the application works. It solves the problem that they care about, and uh, there isn't a need to go and re-architect or um, modernize it in any sort of particular way, and um, we recognize that like Cloud Foundry as a platform should continue to support those use cases. And there isn't necessarily a good reason for us to force those developers to have to go back and fix uh, problems in an application that just works. Have you had any thoughts about providing any kind of tooling support for migration between, say, the old PHP build back and the new one? We looked at this probably a year and a half ago when we were still investigating whether or not it was reasonably viable for us to do something like take the Paquetto build packs and shim them into the Cloud Foundry build packs. What that required is we had to go and like kind of catalog what are all the differences between what we have in Paquetto and what we offer in Cloud Foundry. And at the beginning of that shim build pack, we would have code that basically looks at your application and tries to turn it into something Paquetto would recognize as an equivalent application. Um, and it turns out that there's like significant number of edge cases at that point. I think for migration support, there are some cases where we could automate some portion of those things, especially for types of language families where there isn't a huge difference between what we provide in Paquetto and what we provide in Cloud Foundry. But for others, in a lot of ways, the best we can do is document what the differences are and explain the sets of changes the developer might have to make in order to move the application. Yeah, I, I think certainly from, from my perspective, that, that would be a really valuable thing to have as a, as a, a user of the thing, um, just because I know we have teams that maybe don't have any of the people left or have to pay contractors to come and do this. And so the easier it is uh, and the less time it takes, the better. Yeah, I, I think at a minimum, documenting those differences would be very helpful. And then uh, either understanding cases where you know, maybe there could be some backend shimming even for a subset of those, or also conversely understanding, like even from those previous explorations, what the edge cases are. Um, because you know, if you're taking that application and you're adjusting the code base, like you're now effectively going to be doing those changes in that code base instead of having them try to do, be handled automatically on the server side. And so one way or another, I'd imagine that edge case is going to raise its head somewhere. <laughs> I mean, even something as simple as, um, you know, migrating from the BP config folder to whatever the, the new format is, I'm not I've used the cloud native build packs a little bit, but not much. Um, even that would be valuable, to be honest. Uh, any more? No, brilliant. Well, thank you very much for your time, folks. That was very, very interesting. Um, on to the, the next thing in the... Uh, Agenda, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> um, yes, reviewing what we have on the board, outstanding PRs. If I recall correctly, we start in to review and then go on to the inbox. Is that right? Is that the way we normally do it? Cool. Right. Uh, bottom to top or top to bottom? I don't recall. <laughs> or is it dealer's choice? <laughs> Uh, might be good to check on any new stuff that's come in since um, uh, since we last met. So I guess probably more towards the bottom. Yeah, bear with me. The Mac has just helpfully closed that window on me. Thank you for that, Max. Right. 
So last update, 5th of July, July 12th. Um, remove Andy Payne from the working group. Looks like no action to be taken here for now. Agreed? Yep. Yeah, I think so. I think we're just waiting on the working group itself. Yep. Yep. Next up. Formula track aspiring approves. We've already been through that one. Then July 9th, going backwards in time. Uh, transfer Bosch bootloader to app runtime deployments. Yeah, the um, workgroup meeting for runtime deployments is this Thursday, so have to wait. There's a little bit of feedback from, from Dave on it. We will see. <laughs> Brilliant. Nice and easy. And finally, stem cell release schedule. Yeah, I try to reach out to the owner of this uh, <laughs> PR, but he is in, uh, oh, what do you call it, paternity leave. So we can just rest it. Or if the working group, uh, yeah, Ruben, if you say no way, then we can also just close it and uh, Thomas can reopen it if uh, he requests for it. I'm fine with leaving it open. Oh, let's leave it be then. Uh, right. Do we want to look at in progress or inbox? What's the way we normally do this? I guess in progress, so at least I moved something <laughs> into in progress. <laughs> Looking at the dates on these. And UAA pipeline project from July 12th. Oh, that's working group related, right? They should, there's nothing. Yep. Looks like nothing to me. Yeah, they could just merge it, right? If I think I, I commented on that. that this, is, this is old enough that it doesn't conform to the YAML format. Ah, OK. Bad luck. <laughs> so is this now just waiting on um person who raised it to fix it up or are we Yeah, let's let's give them a chance to respond. Or you know, if we if we had uh anyone associated with the foundational infrastructure working group available, they could yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't on vacation or pretending to leave, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, uh, be careful, Ruben. I mean, you know, <laughs> doesn't have people on leave right now. Uh, add RERFC 279. Last update. This is affectionately known as the spicy PR. Okay. Ah, the spicy PR. Yep. <laughs> we, are good. we are good to go, I would say. So the workgroup automation runs now, and we should now see all uh, standard working groups, uh, GitHub teams for all working groups, all working group areas. Um, uh, no, I think, and, so I think no? I'm looking at a different thing. Ah. Two, 279 versus 262. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, okay, it looks like 279 has no action, just waiting on responses. Uh, again, a nice neat one. Uh, right, yes, let's look at 262 then. It sounds like folks yeah, have opinions. So, uh... <laughs> From my point of view, spice can be applied. The question is in which doses, uh, <laughs> how spicy shall it be? Uh, there's one observation that we uh, saw recently when adding a new approver to um, cloud controller, and that is branch 
uh, protection or restriction rules uh, in GitHub because they are not managed by the automation and they need to be adapted manually. So that we were surprised that uh, yeah, a new colleague didn't cut committer rights while he could approve the RS and the reason was a branch uh, protection rule on the old teams. So that is something that the workgroup leads need to uh, maintain and, and switch over to the new teams manually. Otherwise, yeah, the question is really the approach. I mean, you could do it, let's say, not so spicy by asking the work group leads, for instance, uh, to remove all the teams. Um, I guess then we will meet in four weeks again, and uh, maybe five teams out of 200 are gone. The other more spicy approach is that we set a deadline in two weeks. We could remove everything, but the uh, either somehow marked uh, teams or um, and and everything that is non-standard gets removed, and that will probably then lead to some escalations, and some teams need to be resurrected, whatever. But it's more promising that uh, at least we reduce the number of uh, teams and clean up. That's something I usually would propose in such situations. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not an easy decision, I would say. No. Whatever you we do. have a system in place to make overrides with the automation currently? We can. I mean, uh, if you maintain a team in the Cloud Foundry YAML, it will be kept. It will not be. Okay, yeah, so I think, we've got yeah, to we do a manual the key. Key patch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK. OK, so we're going to delete all the teams out of the Cloud Foundry yeah, org. Man. Yeah, Cloud Foundry org. Uh, or, or the Cloud Foundry. No, org slash Cloud Foundry .yaml. Yes, we're going to remove the teams there and then only have them uh, automatically generated ones. And then we can add back the things that we want if needed. Yeah. Are we sure that the teams get deleted or do we have to actively mark them as archived or something? This is something I don't know. We have to try it out. I guess we could remove it from the YAML and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> I, I understood this tool that it will be removed. Uh, it should be a complete picture uh, of the world. But yeah, I think so. You have to try it out, I would say. Is it worth just creating a dummy team with a couple of people in it? Remove it with that's already in the YAML, then removing it and seeing what it does? Or you can create a team and see if it gets deleted. Yeah. Yes. I think I or we have one work group lead that uh, wants to give it a try because there's a certain <laughs> team that really got replaced by, uh, let's yeah, say, sure. uh, one Go of ahead. the standard teams. Yeah, just, uh, <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> just an idea. <laughs> Take the foundation of structure working group on multiplication anyway. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I think that will be fine because I think we already switched over to the new teams for the places that we care about. Mm -hmm. I could also approach uh, Greg because uh, he opens uh, this PR, so he should have an interest. <laughs> and, uh, the same is true also for, for interfaces, at least in the copy area. I guess uh, it should work out. Besides, yeah, concourse uh, authorization is something where you need to look uh, for if you have used the teams and then these uh, branch protection rules. And there's probably something more that we haven't noticed yet, but that will show up. Okay, it, it sounds to me like we want to ask for a guinea pig before we apply this to everything, if if I've understood you correctly. Well, I mean, we're already generate we're already generating all of the approver teams for all of the working groups now. Like those exist as the replacement teams, right? And so now it's just this kind of inchoate mass of old teams that nobody really has ownership over. I mean, there might be specific ones that working groups would know about and could delete as the kind of ad hoc legacy teams that we've been working with. Um, I mean, I've, I feel like I, maybe we're at the point where we could just comment on this. Maybe now that we have the working group lead team, comment to them and maybe all the approvers and say like, hey, we're going ahead with this. Um, maybe give folks a few days to do a final assessment and see if there's anything that they think is out of place or, um, but I feel like we're, we've been moving incrementally towards this and we're in a position where we can do the transition and kind of seems like, let's just pull off the bandaid and uh, see what hairs come out. 
yeah, it like looking at the common history, this looks like it's been going on for a very long time. Um, so better for some short term pain, perhaps, than yeah, much more of this. <laughs> I mean, uh, Ruben, maybe, maybe we should double check with some of the, the VMware folks to see if there's anything particularly urgent going on right now. I, I know that there's been some security deadlines and things that we've been targeting internally. And if this would throw a wrench into works like this week as bad timing, then you know maybe we could hold off until next week or something. But otherwise, I'm inclined to just go forward. Yeah, but well, like we can start a final comment period or something, right? For like, and that would mean basically next week we we can go ahead unless something has come up. Yeah, sure, that sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Maybe yeah, we should uh, really uh, apply a sentence and write down what we want to do because that's uh, that's just this conversation to the like ah well this is file remove. Well, it's pretty clear. <laughs> to move <laughs> that are outside of the governance model. And also, we have GitHub, right? So we can always go back sure. in time and revert. Yeah. Undo things that way. Okay. Then let's start the final comment weekend. Great. Sounds like mm -hmm. a plan. Uh, who wants to go and just notify? the working group leads that this is a thing that's going to happen next week. Um, you've got end days just to do a final check and then we'll merge it next week. Yeah, th there's one thing to think about, which is I think teams can have discussions as well, right? Come again? I think there's discussions in teams. So I don't know, like you, like I'm saying you can revive it, everything, but if you delete a team and they have actually content in a team, right. then that would be different. I don't know if that's used anywhere, just something that occurred to me that I've seen at some point. Uh, Do the working groups no, yeah, reliably respond in? Like if if you give them a deadline, do they reliably respond? I'm not aware of anyone using discussions in the community. Mm. I mean, maybe there's some way we could find out. But and the working group leads could ask and uh, give a veto then uh, for the removal. I mean, they still have this yeah. one week. Yeah, it would be some comment period. Least. Yeah, it would be a good thing to, to put in there, right? To say like, check if you don't use, be aware that uh, discussions within teams will be lost. And if people happen to use that, maybe we need to find a way to rename a team to what the automation generates because then they can keep their old ID basically. Yeah, that, that sounds like a reasonable plan to me. Give them a week's notice and raise any issues, potentially veto if the issue is sev severe enough, then merge this time next week. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll, I will stick that notice in there if nobody else wants to volunteer to do that. <laughs> yeah, if you get a chance to, Andy, that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah, just make a note of that. I'll add it to the actions for this week. Ah, uh, yes, actions. I was going to stick it under review outstanding PRs for some reason. Makes more sense to stick it under actions. <laughs> thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. I think that's everything in progress looking at the dates on things. Uh, July 8th, four days ago. Yes. This is 339. Uh, it's yes, more technical it thing. Um, this, it's also GitHub uh, automation. Uh, if a PR is merged, then the GitHub automation uh, creates all the teams that is working now, but it takes close to six hours. And if it fails uh, at the moment, the job would also create a PR with a current dump uh, that can be helpful for debugging. Uh, this one will definitely go beyond six hours and will 
fail all the time. So we don't see these PRs. And uh, what I tried to do here uh, is to split it up into two separate jobs so that we can have two times six hours. Um, I don't know if it's working because I couldn't test it. So it would require then probably iterative uh, commits until it works if something is wrong. And it might have an impact on the schedule because then such a thing can take close to 12 hours, right? Two times six. Um, I hope this stuff gets faster when we have deleted the non-standard teams, but at the moment, it takes that long. So is this just taking so long just because of the vast number of teams? Probably. And and uh, the throttling. I, I get up with throttling our token. Ideally, we oh. should be caching responses, but... <laughs> okay. Um... So do we just want to spend some time to review this and decide on it next week? Mm, I think Maybe. we shouldn't discuss this in the working or in the TOC. I mean, I can just review it because I've been working. Review, yeah, and then with we can Stefan do uh, yeah, yeah, then we do an iteration over it. I just want to don't want to merge it uh, without uh, showing it. Yeah. Uh, normally, you want to have somebody else uh, looking at it. That's it's yeah. nothing for. Yeah, it's no content for the TOC. I agree. Okay. Yeah, just request review or like I will review it now, but going forward, just request the review for me or something. Yeah, I, I did. Oh, you did. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> yeah, sure. That's all oh, fine. <laughs> right into the inbox, then. Is there anything from 2022 in here? July 12th. Seven. So the last, the last one meeting was. Uh, the last is uh, I, I raised an issue uh, that's the three four two, and that is actually a real problem. Uh, I uh, received complaints that the uh, PR validation for, for instance, role changes don't work. It fails permanently, and the root cause seems to be strange scopes and authorization rights on the GitHub token. And it is different whether I open a PR on a branch of the community repo or a change gets opened from a fork of the community repo. That seems so far I uh, I got, but I don't have more details. And uh, you get a 401 unauthorized on listing org invitations. That's it. And if somebody has more experience on the GitHub or uh, API authorization model, so some help would be very welcome here. Yeah, I think you need to set this at a it's either the org level or repo level. Um, what the default permissions are. Otherwise, I think you need to configure it in the workflow YAML off the top of my head because I've seen something like this before. Um, but I will see if I can dig something up and mm -hmm. leave a comment during the week. Because at the moment, the whole comment. role change process doesn't work for uh, anybody but workgroup leads and uh, TOC members. And that's that was not the intention. <laughs> I mean, there are other solutions. We could uh, skip the uh, Peribolos run. Uh, we have then less validation. We only let the... Um, this, this Python coding run that at least validates the YAML format, etc. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, hopefully, I will find some time <coughs> to look at this what's more Stephen, deeply this week. What Stefan was suggesting actually makes sense because we now have that Python validation, right? And we are generating the so the org not uh, our Cloud Foundry YAML file is becoming more of an implementation detail at this point. Or after the spicy pre arc gets merged, right? So at mm -hmm. that point, we basically just have the we need validation on the schema of the working groups, not so much on the very very broader stuff. So I I would actually vote for just using the the schema validation going forward because we didn't have that when we introduced this check thing. That was just like a better than mm -hmm. nothing thing, uh, but actually the schema validation is what we want. Yeah, if somebody edits the Cloud Foundry YAML directly, 
there could be problems, but okay, we will see it when merged definitely. And uh, then we have to revert and normally nobody should edit those files. Uh, yeah, should. And you know, if you archive yeah. something, if you add a new repo, then you have to edit uh, this yeah, file but uh, still. But maybe like in the future, we will even start generating those definitions based on the um, mm -hmm. team, the working group definitions. I don't know, like, right. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, that's also an approach uh, that is easily uh, can easily be done, and then the, the process would work. And if we find out, then I would go with this road and and change that uh, file a PR for removing this from the workflow. Yeah. That's because I think the concern is that like if if anybody can raise a, or create a PR and they have permissions, basically there's like a Tmux GitHub action thing that you could put in there. So you basically yeah, access yeah. and then you get the token. Um, mm. And that's not ideal because then they have access to the org. So it's a big security concern. Okay, yep. I will comment on the ticket and file a PR. Can you actually um, tell GitHub Actions only run this workflow if a PR is coming from a fork? I don't know. And not another workflow? Or is that not a problem in the solution you're proposing here? The solution I'm proposing no. is don't use the token at all, just validate the schema uh, on, on these things. These I mean, the, the, the issue is that uh, Peribolos uh, requires uh, unusual uh, access rights. Uh, it wants to access the whole org, uh, etc. Normally, GitHub Actions work on one repo, and probably the uh, yeah scopes are sufficient for that. But here, I mean, we do pretty nasty things. But we don't normally run yeah. Parabolos on <laughs> PR on PRs only on merges. Makes sense. Okay. I have to drop as well. So I should probably. Yeah. Cut no worries. Uh, so, for future reference, do we normally just run to an hour or until we've got through the list of things? To, to one an hour. hour. Okay. An hour, yeah. Good to know. Typically, we are faster, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes. Um, do we have any docs for all of the automation we have in place? So I should get myself up to speed. Uh, there is for the automation. There is a doc uh, in the org folder of uh, the community repo. There's a readme, and that one explains uh, what it does. And brilliant. I'll go find that. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, let's wrap up then. Have okay. a good week, <laughs> and see you next week. Bye. Right, see you next week. Bye. Bye.